Well, there's a lot of really interesting business questions here because you're basically at the cutting edge of uh, science, of technology, of physics, of engineering, uh, trying to basically innovate into the future uh, rapidly. How do you uh, how do you do that? Because the R and D here, the research alone, is a lot of money. Mm-hmm. So what's well, I mean, what can you say about that? Like how to f- be bold and fearless in pushing this technology into the future when so much is unknown and it costs so much to just do the research. So I think about this in a couple of ways. One, the need. Um, We look to the world and we know the world needs clean, low cost, safe electricity. And just to meet our needs today and not to even talk about the needs of tomorrow or the needs of AI or any of, uh, or the growth that's probably coming just to meet today. And so, but fundamental to that is it has to be a product that people will buy. It has to be a generator that is making that electricity at low cost. And it's got to be soon. And so so a lot of what I think about is how do we do those two things together? Um, and and a lot of that is scale. And, and a lot of that is thinking about, and not big scale. In fact, it's the opposite of that. It's small scale. It's how do you build a product that's mass producible, that you can build quickly and learn quickly. Mm-hmm. And what I've found in my career at this is that they're actually the same thing. And that the faster you can build a thing, the faster you can learn if that thing works, the the faster you can now, de- you can actually iterate on that and build the next thing. And so what what I have spent my career building is teams of humans and a company are builders that can build high technology things quickly. That if you want to do R&D, you don't want large scale, multinational, complex, huge systems. You want to actually take the smallest thing you can build that that accomplishes the mission. And in fusion, there is a minimum size, but accomplishes the mission and then build it quickly and build whole teams around building it quickly and incentivize folks to move quickly, iterate and learn. Um, and kind of the irony, I think, of one of the things that I've discovered is that by focusing on manufacturing, by focusing on low cost, very rapid manufacturing, you actually get to do science faster. And, and at the beginning of my career, I would never have guessed that. I would have thought the way to do science is to make a giant demonstration particle accelerator somewhere like, mm-hmm. uh, to make a large, complex science experiment is the best way to do science. And what I found is actually small, iterative, just building as fast as possible gets you there faster because you can learn, you can build, you can iterate, you can solve the problems, and then you can learn the fundamental physics, learn the scaling, learn the FRC and the B to the 3.77 power, and learn those things way sooner than if you would have just started on one mega project and then waited decades to get to the answer. There's a profound truth in that. Something about the constraints of pushing for the simple, for the low cost, for the manufacturable, that that pushes everything, pushes the science, pushes the innovation. In fact, you should maybe explain that you're, I believe, on the seventh prototype. Like, this is insane. The rate of innovation here is insane. Um, Can you maybe speak to all the different prototypes you went through, what it took to just iterate rapidly and and maybe it would be really interesting for people, like what can you say about the teams that's required uh, to make that happen? Like what kind of people are required mm-hmm. to make that happen at that fast rate? And we're not we're not talking about like software here. We're talking about everything, the full stack, mm-hmm. all the way down to the physics at a hundred million degrees <laughs> at speeds of one million miles per hour. I mean, it's insane. Anyway, so what? Uh, how do you iterate? the prototypes and what kind of teams make it happen. So at Helion, we've, we've built uh, seven systems. Um, the first six were a series of prototypes that we built end to end that were focused on scaling the process of making these field reverse configurations, compressing them to 
thermonuclear fusion conditions and demonstrating that you can do fusion and then increasing the scale, increasing the temperature and the energy. The very first ones were named after beer. Actually, the most successful was the Inductive Plasmoid Accelerator, the IPA. And it was the first system that showed that the team could make these FRCs and hold on to them and understand some of the stability criteria, the heating criteria. Um, and then we started increasing the field. Now, okay, great. We can hold on to one of these FRCs. We know how long and how to make them, but now can we squeeze on them and start doing fusion, um, increasing in pressure and temperature? What we noticed is, is um, you know, machine after machine, we always used Starbucks. We're in we were in Redmond at the time, Redmond, Washington, and uh, Starbucks cups sitting on top of the machine as the, this is the scale. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, they were too small to have a human really in the picture all the time. So the Starbucks cup was enough. And, uh, and so then we switched to tall, grande, venti, um, <laughs> and then the biggest Trenta mm -hmm. was the biggest system that came online in 2020. Mm -hmm. That was a system that showed 100 million degrees and was the first system that did deuterium and helium-3 fusion. In fact, as far as we know, the only bulk deuterium-helium-3 fusion uh, that has been done and also showed the 100 million degree fusion temperatures from an FRC. And throughout that time, the earliest work was government-funded, government grants. SBIRs and other type of government grants. And, and actually the team involved, uh, myself and, and the rest of the founding team, were really good at winning government programs, doing fundamental science, but moving very quickly. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ways to think about how to iterate and how to build quickly. I want to talk about the teams first, and then we can talk about some of the technology mm -hmm. pieces to do that. Um, but a lot of it is, is thinking about if your goal is to get the product electricity out to the world as soon as possible, then you should be looking at everything you do towards that lens. And so that's thinking about the materials you choose. You want to, at every turn, choose commonly available materials. If you have to wait for supply chain for a ultra rare material, it's going to take you a lot more time. And so do everything you can to an engineer a system that uses simple aluminum alloys, simple copper up alloys. Um, and if you have to use tungsten, and maybe you have to use tungsten in some of your systems, which is a hard to find alloy, make sure you're using commonly available thicknesses of tungsten sheet. You know, those kinds of engineering uh, analyses and thought processes at every step. Um, and, and that's how we built these systems from IPA to Venti up to Trenta was always looking at how do we build systems that are easy to build and mass produced? Because this is the other thing that I don't know that early in my career I'd have predicted is that um, by making a hundred of a thing, you can actually make it faster <laughs> than if you go make one of a thing. Yeah, And that because when you look at our fusion systems, we talked about these big magnets. And you could build one giant, big, complex, hard to make magnet that's heavy and you have to move it around with a crane and uh, requires very complex machining by ultra rare CNCs. Or you could then make that out of a composite of 100 smaller magnets. Each of those magnets now can be made on a simple machine. Each of these magnets can be picked up by a human. They're light enough. They can be made and manufactured and mass produced. And, and that's what we did. And that was our whole design philosophy on these machines is every, at every turn, how do we go faster? Um, a, a classic one that uh, still to this day I push the team on is, again, thinking about how do you move fast? eBay. Mm -hmm. We buy and... And uh, I don't know that I've ever said this publicly. Oh boy! Um, Here we go. This is great. <laughs> we spend a lot of time on eBay. You got to you got to find a way. Yeah. You got to move. And here's an example: uh, we use a vacuum pump because in these systems you got to pull out all the air. Mm -hmm. So we use a vacuum pump called a turbo molecular vacuum pump. This is a commodity. This is used in a variety of particle accelerators, scientific applications. There are many of them. They're robust. They last a long time. They also have a very small supply chain. So if you want to buy a brand new turbo molecular pump, you can, and you might wait nine months from the manufacturer mm -hmm. to go make one for you and deliver it for you. But I can go today and get the same model that was made 10 years ago and get it on eBay today, right now. However, it might not work. <laughs> like you don't know yet. There's some, you know, how well it works or how clean it is or any of those things. And so what we do is you don't go to eBay to save money. It does. It's cheaper and that's great. But 
you can also go and get three of those turbo pumps that are sitting on e- in eBay right now. Bring those in-house, test them. Maybe only one of them meets the specifications you need. But guess what? You just got a pump in two weeks instead of nine months. Yeah. And you got it, and it's in the door, and it's operational, and it's running, and you're moving. See, I love that. that I love that kind of stuff. Um, one of the only people I've really seen do that is Elon. Now he he put together that uh, cluster in Memphis in, in in a matter of weeks, which is uh, has, nothing like that has ever been done before, and <laughs> this this eBay way is is really the kind of thing that's required to make that happen, as you shortcut the the supply chain, and everywhere you can, you still have to deliver the working product, and right? That, that is cannot sacrifice the quality, but do you really need the shiny brand new one? when when the used one is going to do the job. Um, and we think about that across the board. Do we take the best plasma diagnostic, the most sophisticated plasma diagnostic in the world that that's 3%, um, that has an accuracy of within 3%, and it's going to take me three years, maybe a few million dollars to go build? Or do I take a technology from 10 years ago that's 5% accurate, that's good enough that I can go build in a month? And, and the answer for at, at, for us, for Heliana, for the team that we put together, is that scrappy. I want to just solve the problem. I don't need necessarily the best solution, but let's go let's go go make it happen. And so that's something that we routinely do. I think uh, sometimes I have challenges with my my academic colleagues on mm-hmm. this. Is that we have a difference of opinion because that three percent? Well, that's way better than five percent. Mm-hmm. So shouldn't you do that? You'll know your data better. But five percent is good enough. Now fifty percent would not be good enough. And so that that technology wouldn't have been applicable. And so finding that middle ground is is, is a hard thing to do. Um, and never compromising on the quality and the safety. Like it's got to work and it's got to be safe. Um, uh, but can you still go fast? But in general, just having a culture of pushing uh, the rate of uh, iterations here mm-hmm. and building the team that wants to go build things yeah. like. Everyone at Helion, uh, or at least the vast majority of Helion, we hire engineers, and scientists, and technicians, and machinists, are hands-on builders. The company at Helion is very weird for a fusion company. Today, we are 50% technicians, not scientists. Nice. And, and we have a ton of scientists, because the science is critically important too, but they're supported by a huge manufacturing company. Mm -hmm. Um, And our goal is to build as fast as possible. Some of the other things we try to do there, vertically integrate. And this is to, to, to your point on Elon Musk, like this is one of the things he's focused on at his companies has been, how do you bring it in side the critical things that are going to drive timelines the things you can't just go buy as a commodity product and and get it here soon and make sure that you can go build those fast and so we've done now a number of key vertical menu integrated manufacturing um lines at helion Uh, i think we may be the only fusion company with a conveyor belt actually our second one just came online now where we have uh so we have literally our production line manufacturing power supplies at Helion um, so that we can move at maximum velocity rather than finding an external consultant or an external supplier to go do those. Uh, well, I love it. Builder first company, and you're also thinking about manufacturing mm-hmm. throughout all of this. I'm looking at, uh, at the photo of Trenta. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful. And you can actually, I can point out uh, on this picture one perfect example of what I'm talking about. So uh, on the end is a green structure, green fiberglass. This is called G10. Um, Actually, ironically, one of the main structural elements we use is this G10 fiberglass material. It's the same thing that's in PCB boards. It's the same substrate that's in every every circuit board. And so we know it's strong. It's good with electricity. Um, Only we get big pieces of it and machine it. But even in the end, you can see the bolts halfway through. Um, There's nine bolts in the middle (laughs) there. (laughs) The standard piece of G10 was not big enough to fit the end of the machine. And so we could have had one custom manufacturer manufacture a brand new piece of a custom size, build a new mold and a new machine. It would have taken, I don't remember anymore now, but probably on the order of usually these are about six to 12 months. Or I could go to a supplier off the shelf, have that delivered in a week, and now machine it with all the bolts in between. Mm -hmm. And then in-house, have the G10 uh, machine shop that can now machine the bolt holes to actually bolt those pieces together. 
And so that's that took extra engineering and having really clever and brilliant mechanical and structural engineers to figure out how to do that and still meet the needs of the fusion system. And but that that's what we try to that's the kinds of teams we, we try to build at Helion is folks that want to really get their hands dirty, get hands on, build things and move quickly um, and everywhere you can without sacrificing quality or safety. Take shortcuts. <laughs> that's the name of the game. We got to get fusion online as soon as possible. Yeah, this is really exciting and really inspiring. Uh, so the, I have to ask then, what uh, what timeline do you think? Like first working out there, nuclear fusion power plant. Mm -hmm. When do you think? Yeah, so um, what we've been able to do is build, rapidly build, every few years, bring a new fusion system online. Um, in 2023, we signed a deal with Microsoft to build a power plant for Microsoft, for one of their data centers. And this is a power plant um, that is plugged into the grid, generating electricity from fusion. And um, and with a very, very tough, ambitious timeline of 2028 for the first electrons from that power plant. And that power plant will be powering a data center. That power plant will be powering the grid that the data center is plugged into. And we can get into the details of, of how how the power grid works and and such but yes mm -hmm. so microsoft will be buying the power from that power plant props to microsoft for like creating a hard deadline i love it they are they are and <laughs> uh it is daily that we think about that deadline um we had been working with them on and off through all of those machines through grande venti trenta um so they had seen us build hit milestones show that we can do fusion scale up by orders of magnitude and then and then access these advanced fusion fuels so they had seen all of those things um and seen the manufacturing we've built we're already right now building the manufacturing to support that power plant we're doing that today um we started two years ago on doing the work around siting around the interconnects. How do you plug fusion in? What does it look like? How do you cite it? What are the environmental consequences? Who's going to regulate it? All of those things. So we spent a lot of time already and we're we're on our way. And it's going to be hard. Like no joke about it. This is this is tough. And it's something that we think I think about every day. 